In John 8, 32, John writes, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, we know that when John writes truth, he means Jesus, because in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. Yes. Jesus is at the door knocking, waiting for you to let him in, waiting for you to walk with him. He wants you to walk in his truth. He wants you to walk in the truth every single day. his word down into one sentence. Love God and love people. That's what basic training is built off of. Well, good morning, CLC. The video you just watched was a highlight recap video of, our, uh, of all of our fine arts students at Fine Arts this year. Let me tell you, church, our students did an amazing job in fine arts. You know, through fine arts, we help students discover, develop, and deploy the gifts that God has given, given them. And fine arts is a huge competition amongst all of these churches all over Ohio. Let me tell you, church family, our students did an amazing job. Many of them got first place, top three in their respective categories. Can we we give it up for our students for that. They are absolutely amazing. Well, it's Next Gen Weekend, and my name is Pastor Chris. I'm a high school pastor here at Christian Life Center, and I have the privilege, the great honor to bring the Word of God today. Who's excited to dig into the Word of God today? To see how extraordinary Jesus is. You know, up here on the stage this morning, you have seen students close worship and prayer. You've seen students lead worship or, or lead us into worship, into God's presence. Didn't they do an amazing job this morning? Isn't that awesome? It's, it's phenomenal to see what God is doing in and through our student ministry. If you're a high school student, I would love to see you at, at, at service t tonight. It's move up weekend. We're having Kona ice, all kinds of stuff. We would love to see you at service. Well, today we're going to talk about extraordinary Jesus. But before we talk about that, I have a confession to make. Can I make a confession to my church family today? Is that okay? All right. Um, it, this confession could rock you. All right, it could shake you. you. You might even look down on me after this confession. Are you sure you want to hear it? Some of you are like, I absolutely want to hear it. Um, are you ready? Are you ready? This is kind of nerve wracking, all right? I'm not perfect. Are you surprised? I would even go a step further to say, I'm a sinner. I've sinned. I've fallen short of God's glory. I want to see if I'm in good company today. If you would, by show of hands, if you're not perfect, would you just raise your hand? Yeah. Oh, wow. All right, give it up for yourselves. That's okay. We're all not perfect. It's okay to not be perfect, okay? There's only one person who was perfect, and that person was Jesus. L let me ask you another question today. How many of you in this room, by show of hands, from the moment you were born until the moment you sat down in that seat in your entire life have ever told a lie? Oh, I see some hands not going up. If some hands didn't go up, just nudge that person because we've all told a lie. I remember one of the first lies I ever told as a kid. I felt so convicted. I felt so bad. I thought God had, was gonna like abandon me and leave me because I lied. I was raised up in church. Where's all my church people at? You were born and raised in the church. That was me, okay? How many of you, by show of hands, would be honest today, be honest, would say, at one time or another in your life, you've cheated. Anybody? Okay. Okay, yeah, I remember the first time in my life that I cheated, or that I got caught cheating, rather. I was in middle school. Can anybody relate? I cheated on a test, and my teacher, Miss Pierce, found out. She was one of my favorite teachers. She was actually my third grade teacher, but she was also one of my middle school teachers. And she found out that I cheated. And let me tell you, she made me feel so bad. I felt the Holy Ghost like come over me right there at the school. I felt so convicted. Um, let me ask another question. How many of you, by show of hands, have ever stolen anything? Anybody ever stolen anything? Like, or borrowed something without asking and not returned it. You know what I'm saying? Like you've stolen something, okay? I remember the first time I stole something. Um, I was at the gas station with my dad. We were at the gas station and I wanted a candy bar. And I was like seven or eight years old. My dad said, no, that wasn't stopping me. 
No, it wasn't. I didn't really know any better, but it wasn't stopping me. So I grabbed a candy bar, put it in my pocket. We got in the car, pulled out of the gas station. As soon as we hit the road, guess what I did? <laughs> Opened that candy bar. I'm chowing down on this candy bar. My dad, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, nothing. I have chocolate on my face, right? I'm like, nothing. Dad, he was like, where'd you get that candy bar? I'm like, the gas station. <laughs> yeah. Guess what my dad did? We turned right back around. He made me walk back into the gas station, apologize for stealing it, and then he made me pay for it. I'll never forget that moment. Let, let's keep going. How many of you have ever gossiped about somebody? Doesn't it feel good to just get it out in the open, right? Okay. <laughs> Some of you are like pointing at somebody. Don't do that. Don't do that. We're in church today. You're like, they, they're the gossipers. Um, doesn't it feel good to get it out? How many of you have ever been jealous, envious of somebody? You know, I think it was last Sunday, my wife and I, we were out in the parking lot, somebody in this church, maybe you're here today. I want you to know I love you. You drove by and I seen your vehicle from afar. It was a Tesla. And I was like, I want that really bad. If, if that is you, I would love to borrow it for a while without returning and without asking. How many of you have ever been selfish, jealous, drunk, drug abused, cheated on your spouse? The list goes on and on and on. And you notice how hands started going down and kind of sucked the, the tension came in the room, sucked the, the air out of the room for a second. The reason why is because as I begin to mention some of these sins that we've committed, the reality is, is in the Bible or, or in our world, some of these sins are socially acceptable and others are not socially acceptable. For us in, as humans, we, we have different degrees and values of sin. We measure some sins as little sins and big sins, but the reality and the truth is, is that God sees all sin the same. Sin is sin. And the reality of it is, is we're all sinners in need of a savior. Come on somebody, right? We're all sinners in need of a savior. The reality today is we all need forgiveness and we all need Jesus. Today, we're going to explore the stories of two women in the Bible. One is unnamed, one is named, both with broken and horrible pasts, but both have an encounter with Jesus that changes absolutely everything. Today, we're gonna to talk about the extraordinary Jesus who forgives and sets us free. How many of you in this room are forgiven today? How many of you are set free today? That's what we're gonna talk about in today's message. We're gonna be digging into the word of God in John. John 8 talks about this woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And before we talk about that, I just wanna rewind all the way to John 1. You know, as Pastor Stan and I were going through uh, my message this Wednesday, he asked me to talk about the woman caught in the act of adultery and this other woman, which we'll talk about her here in a second. And uh, as I was going through my message, he said, you need to add some tension. There's some tension that you're missing here in your message, Pastor Chris. You need to add some tension. So I, I got, got on my face and started praying to the Lord and digging into the Word and I, I just seeing some tension uh, that I found in the Word of God at the very beginning of John. So John chapter 1 talks about Jesus. And it's, it's amazing that we see that the Word became flesh. Isn't that amazing to see that the Word of God became flesh and bone? That we need a Savior that can relate to us, that sees us, that understands us, that, that isn't some far off God, but He came right here to be with us. You see, before Jesus came and stepped foot on our planet, humanity was lost in sin. And truth is, is we're still lost in sin. We're without, but we're not without hope because we have the hope of the world, which is Jesus Christ. Before Jesus stepped onto the planet, we needed more than the 10 commandments. We needed more than the laws of Moses and the Old Testament laws. We needed more than that. We needed Jesus because he would personify the principles that were contained within the word of God. Let, let me say it this way. Let me say it this way. If I'm sick, cough, 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 COVID. If I'm sick, don't throw me a medical book. Take me to a doctor because the doctor personifies everything that's written in the medical book. Make sense? If I am in trouble with the law, don't throw me a law book. I'm not gonna read that thing. I need a lawyer who personifies the law book that understands and knows the laws of our country. If I need some help mentally, 
don't throw me a self-help book or a, a, a psychiatry book. I need to go talk to a counselor or a, psycho- or a psychologist or, or who can help me mentally because he personifies what's in it. So for us, humanity was hopeless. Humanity was in sin. And we couldn't just throw humanity a law book. We tried, the 10 commandments. Every one of us have blown them. We couldn't just throw humanity a law book. Instead, we need a savior. We need a Jesus who personifies everything that's contained in the word of God. And Jesus, the word of God became flesh and he made his dwelling among us. Isn't that amazing to see that Jesus is the word of God and he makes his dwelling among us. I absolutely love that extraordinary Jesus does that. It's amazing. And we see in scripture that it says that the word becomes flesh, makes his dwelling among us. And it says, we've seen the glory the glory of the one and only Son who came of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. And right there in lies the tension. The tension that Pastor Stan and I were even talking about, that grace and that truth. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about this morning? That grace and that truth. Because on the surface, grace and truth, they don't mix very well. On the surface, grace and truth are two opposite things. Consider for a minute the grace of God. It's amazing, right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. We say it all the time. Consider for a minute the grace of God, that it forgives us, that in his grace, we can find forgiveness, wholeness, and happiness in God. Grace can meet you right where where, where we're at. No matter what you've done, no matter where you are, no matter how bad you've been, the grace of God can come to you and forgive you of your sin. It's powerful to know that Jesus would walk through something that he didn't deserve, the cross, so that we could have a heaven that we don't deserve because Jesus offers us grace and forgiveness. Isn't that amazing? Come on, church, isn't that phenomenal? But right next to the grace sits truth his standard, his righteousness, his holiness, that on our very best day, church family, on our very best day, our righteousness is like filthy rags. On our best day, all of our goodness still falls short of the glory of God. It's a crazy thing to think about. And there's some truth that we see in this, and there's tension that in lies in the grace and the truth. The paradox is found in the grace and the truth. And the reality of it is, is, you know, we we see it all the time. We see grace people full of love, quick to forgive. But what happens is if you get too far on the grace scale, we actually lower the standard of his truth. And that can be a dangerous place to be. But we also have truth people too. Oh, you know those people. (laughs) They're the ones who will blast you on Facebook and not apologize about it. They're the ones who will tell you the truth of God and often overlook the word of God. And the, the, the problem with some truth heavy people is they're often pointing the finger, spending so much time pointing the finger at other people that they don't point the finger at themselves and they're slow to give the grace. So how do you balance both grace and truth? Because grace without truth ceases to be grace and truth without grace crushes people and ceases to be truth. Permit me to say it this way, grace without truth is meaningless, but truth without grace is just plain mean. We have to balance the grace and the truth, they're medicine. And Jesus was both full of grace and full of truth. And in our stories today, we're gonna see how he balanced the grace and the truth. Listen, we have to have grace and truth because the wings of the gospel fly on both grace and truth. Kind of like a violin, kind of like a violin. I had a student in my last youth group who's an amazing violin player. He's he's incredible. He had a full ride to Juilliard, but he forsook that, gave that up because he wanted to go into full-time ministry. And he's now at Southeastern. He just graduated and he's about to go into full-time worship ministry. He put his violin down, so to speak, so that he could go into full-time ministry and learn how to lead people into God's presence. But, but, but he, would, he told me one time, he said, Pastor Chris, I said, what are you doing? He was tuning his violin. He said, no matter how well I play, if the strings on my violin are too loose, it's gonna sound ugly. 
And the reality of it is, is if the strings of our violin spiritually are too loose, the grace is gonna make an ugly sound. But he would tell me if I, if I make the strings too tight, it'll actually pop off the violin and it'll break. And if we make the truth too tight in our relationship spiritually, it'll pop off the hinges of what grace can be. You have to have a perfect balance so that beautiful music could be played on the violin. And the same is true when it comes to grace and truth. This is why the Pharisees couldn't understand why Jesus hung out with tax collectors and prostitutes because they were so truth heavy that they overlooked the grace. But Jesus came to embody it both. Notice Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill the law. In, in John eight, we see this woman who's caught in the act of adultery. In the very act of adultery, and our first point today is trapped on the outside. You see, these Pharisees, these teachers of the law couldn't understand, they couldn't understand why Jesus would hang out with such people. So they wanted to catch him in a trap. This woman in our, in our story today, we don't know her title. All we know is her gender and her issue. How many of you would like to be known as this woman in the Bible? The woman caught sleeping with another woman's husband. What a terrible thing. In the meantime, Jesus is teaching kind of like me today, but he probably was doing a whole lot better because he's Jesus, the word made flesh, right? So he's sitting there teaching in the temple courts. There's a horseshoe of listeners. Everyone's surrounded. They wanted to hear the word of God from the word made flesh. He's preaching the word of God, teaching the word of God. In the meantime, just down the streets, these religious people and these people find this woman who is sleeping with another woman's husband, they find out where she's at. They find out where the deed's being done and they run into the room. They pull over the curtains. They pull her out of bed because she was caught in the very act. And they begin to drag her down the streets. And before the sun can even touch her skin, they are calling her names and she can feel the heat of their hate towards her. They're probably calling her things like disgusting, pathetic, how dare you, what are you doing? This is wrong, you're a sinner. You have done so much wrong. And before she even had time to probably cover her body, she's now pulled down the streets in a parade. Imagine as moms scoop up their kids in the streets. Imagine as people peer out the windows of their houses to see what the commotion's all about. Imagine what's happening in this, in this moment as this woman is being brought to the temple courts and she gets brought straight in front of Jesus as he's teaching in a morning Bible study. Imagine if that happened here this morning, it would be crazy. John 1, uh, 2 says this, it says, it says, now early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down, he sat down and he taught them. It says verse three, that the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. The scribes, the keeper of the law, caught a woman in adultery in the very act. And then they, they had set her in the midst. That word midst in scripture literally means middle. This woman got thrown in the middle of a Bible study and they said to him, this is what they said. They said, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Imagine this woman for a second. She's shameful, a prostitute, someone who by definition deserves to die. My question in this moment is where's the guy? He's just as guilty, if not more guilty, but society didn't care on this day. Reality of it is, is every single one of us in this room are just like this woman. Maybe you haven't committed adultery, but every single one of us have sinned. And her sin on this day deemed for her to die. If you don't know, uh, someone caught in the act of adultery by Old Testament law was supposed to die because of their sin. So truth heavy that people leaned on the truth of God that they couldn't forgive people for a mistake that they had had. And I want you to picture yourself in the story. Imagine maybe this is you. Maybe you've been the one who's been thrown in the middle. What, what puts us in the middle? What puts you in the middle? 
What sins have put you in the middle that the enemy constantly reminds you of? It's our secrets, our issues, our late nights on the browsers, doing things we shouldn't be doing. It's our guilt, our pride, our anger, our mistake, our sin is what puts us in the middle. In the meantime, these men have rocks in their hands. We'll talk about that, about that here in a second. But how will Jesus approach us? How will Jesus approach you? Notice that Jesus not once points the woman's sin out. He never tells her, you're an adulterer. You've blown it. You've messed up. You've sinned. You've fallen short. We don't even hear him say the word sin until he sets her free at the end. And John 5 and 6 says this, it says, Now Moses in the law, this is what the men are saying, commanded us that such should be stoned. It goes on to say, but what do you say? They're trying to catch Jesus in a trick. What do you say? They said this testing him that they might have something to accuse him with. This woman was caught in the very act of adultery. But what does Jesus say? How does he respond? Does he, does he trample on the word or does he trample on this woman? What's he gonna do in this moment? If anyone had a right to condemn this woman, it was Jesus. He was the sinless one, the one who never committed a sin, the one who was perfect in all that he does. But you see, we often, we often love to get people in church and tell them how wrong they are, right? We love to get people in church and tell them, hey, you're a sinner, you're wrong, these are the things you need to do to get right. We often tell people that they need to change, but the, the truth is, is I am philosophically and more importantly, theologically convinced that the vast majority of the 7 billion people on this planet know something's wrong on the inside. They already know something's wrong. This woman is trapped. There's no way out. She's trapped. She's surrounded. And these men have rocks in their hands and they're ready to start throwing these rocks at her until she dies. According to Old Testament law, this woman was supposed to be stoned to death. They would basically take large rocks and they would throw them on people until they die. What's Jesus gonna do? In our story today, it says that Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he didn't hear the men. He ignored those that were accusing this woman and he just gets right to work in the tight spaces. I want you to know this morning that Jesus is a God who stoops, that he's a God who comes down to our level, that he's a God who came down from heaven to earth. He didn't wanna fix everything up there, but he came down to our level. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us so he could save your heart because he loves you. He loves broken, hurting, and lost people. It's why Jesus came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's me, that's you, that's all of us because he is the hope of the world. Listen, church, we're not supposed to throw rocks at people. We're supposed to throw ropes at people and pull them out of their pit and pull them out of the places that they're at. That's exactly what Jesus does. He gets to work in the tight spaces with this woman because she is in a, she's in a moment where she is lost, hurting, and broken, and she's about to die. He gets down. He begins to write in the dirt, in the dust with his finger. I can't imagine that moment, but we don't know what Jesus wrote. All we know is he wrote in the dirt. And I imagine as he wrote in the, in the dirt, maybe he thought about the very first time that God the Father touched dirt. The very first time that God bent down and he shaped man and he formed man and he breathed life into man because humanity was made in the likeness and in the image of God. We are his masterpiece. He created each and every one of us. And though this woman was broken and lost and she deserved the rock, she deserved the death, she deserved the stoning according to Old Testament law, she deserved it. And each and every one of us deserve it as well. We all deserve death for the wages of sin are death. But notice what Jesus does. He just gets down and writes in the dirt because Jesus still finds value in humanity. He didn't come to this earth because we were perfect or deserved, deserved it. He came to this earth because we were hurting, lost and broken and fallen people. And he wanted to rescue us out of our brokenness and get us to have eternity in heaven with him. You see, God loved this sinful woman unconditionally. And I want you to know this morning that God loves and values you here in this room. Maybe you're here today and you think, how can God love me? 
How can God, doesn't he know everything I've done? How can God care about me? How can he find value in me? And maybe that's you today. Maybe you think, you know what? I've blown it too many times. How does God find value in me? You should know today that no matter where you're at, that God loves you, that he has a purpose for you. He's got a plan for your life. He's got a destiny and a future that is so bright and he's in the dirt with you because he wants you. And I firmly believe church, I firmly believe that Jesus came to reveal to us a God who, who loves us and values us not by our actions, but on his own love. That's the Jesus that we serve today. Jesus in our story today, he, he ignores her accusers. He ignores her accusers so much so that, um, that he just begins to write. And then he begins to address those who are convicting this woman before he even addresses this woman. He gets right to work removing the tight spaces. Remember, she's in the middle of all of these men with hateful scorns on their faces and rocks in their hands. She's in the middle of condemnation. And now Jesus is in the middle of all of that with her just writing on the ground. Jesus is with her. My question for you today is how willing are you to ignore maybe your reputation for kingdom businesses? Get to love Dayton, serve our city, serve our community, go to places you wouldn't normally go and serve. These men now remove their attention off of the woman and they, then they put their attention upon Jesus. These men were trying to trick Jesus the entire time. How's Jesus gonna respond? Is he, is he gonna let the law trample her? What's he gonna do? What's Jesus gonna do here in this moment? And now Jesus in our story, he raises himself up and scripture says, so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up. He stood up in that moment and he said to them, he who is without sin among you, let them throw a stone at her first. A 15 word statement that silenced the room. Then like a man with unfinished business, Jesus got back to a knee and, and he began to write down on the ground again here in this moment. And verse, nine, or verse eight says that he stooped down again and began to write on the ground. And then he said, uh, and, and for those who heard, it says being convicted by their own conscience. Watch this. It says, and they went out one by one. Say one by one. Beginning with the oldest to the last, they dropped their rocks and walked away. Listen, it says, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. We see that word midst, that word middle again. You see, they came in like a group, but they left in pieces. Because when the enemy comes against you with every assault, with every attack, when Jesus steps in that moment, when he forgives you and sets you free, it shatters the enemy and he leaves in pieces. Have you ever noticed how they left? I noticed it. Have you ever noticed how they left? They left from the oldest to the last. They dropped their rocks and walked away because that's exactly how his forgiveness and his mercy and his grace works. When you come into a relationship with Jesus, when you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, he forgives us from the oldest sin you've ever committed to the last sin you committed before you sat down here in the seats because he forgives and sets you free and whom Jesus sets free and who Jesus forgives is free indeed. Amen, somebody? It's the God that we worship and the God that we serve. Not a halfway free, but a all the way free. Eventually, all of the men leave and drop their rocks and walk away until Jesus is in the midst, in the middle with this woman again. Now what's this woman in? What's she in the middle of now? She's in the middle of his grace. She's in the middle of his love. She's in the middle of his forgiveness. This woman is in the middle of his righteousness and his standard and his holiness. What's Jesus gonna say to this woman? Church, this is the answer to the human soul. We must get people alone with Jesus. Jesus and Jesus alone is the answer to your pain, is the answer to our sin problem, is the antidote and the answer to this world. Jesus removes the guilt, he removes the shame, he removes the voices, and he removes the condemnation off of this woman. In verse 10, eight says this, it says, and when Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to the woman, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Seems to me the text reveals that this woman hadn't even looked up yet. She was probably waiting for the first rock to be thrown. And Jesus says to her, he says, has no one condemned you? She said, 
She looks around, probably pulls back her hair. No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. When we read this, it sounds poetic and it looks absolutely amazing. And it is. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Can we go back to that scripture? Neither do I condemn you. He basically says, that's not how I operate. That's not how I function. That's not how I'm going to be. That's not what I'm going to do. I'm not going to say things or do things that they did to you. Maybe the woman says, I deserve to die. I've committed the sin. I've done the deed. I've blown it. And Jesus says to this woman, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He says, you're free to go. Go and sin no more. At this point, Jesus charged her. We see the grace of God and the neither do I condemn you, but we see the truth of God. Go and sin no more because Jesus embodies both grace and truth. I want you to know today that when we see that neither do I condemn you, Jesus meant it. It's the grace of God. Jesus did the opposite of what this woman probably expected. You see, Jesus offers forgiveness and grace. It forgives us. Aren't you thankful for that today? That Jesus forgives and sets people free? He offers that grace. He offers that mercy. You see, the wages of sin is death. But not just a a physical death. It's a spiritual death. Sin itself separates us from God. All have sinned. Where are my sinners at? It's all of us. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We deserve the stones. We deserve the death. We see the gospel right here in this story today. It's beyond a physical death though. It's hell. For those who haven't given their lives to Christ and accepted his forgiveness and his grace, there is eternal penalty and punishment, which is hell. There's different consequences for the sins that I commit today. Let's just be honest. Some sins I commit are going to get me punched in the face. Others are going to get me a speeding ticket or a ticket. Not that I speed. Others, sometimes. Others are going to get me in jail. There's different consequences. The consequences for sin is death. It's eternal separation from God. And we all need to acknowledge that we do sin and that we all need forgiveness. But right next to the forgiveness and the tension sits righteousness and truth. You see, we also see that Jesus said, go and sin no more. You're thinking, how can I do that? Anybody ever think that? How can I go and never sin again in my life? How can I never get angry or envious? How, how can I live such a life that way? Does, does Jesus really say, go and sin no more? He says what he says and he means what he says. My encouragement to you as a pastor is to go and sin no more. Not just those socially acceptable sins. Don't sin anymore. Well, I don't do the bad ones, Pastor Chris. Like, I don't deserve the rocks. Like, I just do kind of like lie and cheat every once in a while and steal a candy bar here and there. No, no, no matter what it is, the gossip, the hate, the anger, all fall short of his glory, his truth, his standard, and his righteousness. Go and sin no more. The next story I wanna talk about for just a few minutes is the story about another woman except we get this woman's name. Her name is Mary, Mary Magdalene. There's a lot of controversies about Mary Magdalene. You've seen the movies, we've seen the books, we've seen everything people say about Mary Magdalene, but there are a few things we know about Mary Magdalene. One is that she's from the town of Magdala. And one thing we know about the town of Magdala is that it is a town, scholars tell us, is known for its prostitutes and its women who are just so lustful. She was from this town town. It was a town she called home. And before we even see her name mentioned in the Bible, uh, just maybe three or four verses before that, we see this woman who is most likely a prostitute washing the feet of Jesus. And again, we see Mary wash the feet of Jesus at the end of her life as well. We see Mary Magdalene supported Jesus. She was there with Jesus. We also know this about Mary. We know she was a woman. And women in that day and age were looked down upon I'm so thankful though that we serve a God who doesn't look down on anybody. 
He doesn't look down on anybody, no matter your race, your gender, your social backgrounds, where you're from, what street you live on, who your parents were. He, he doesn't look down upon you. He's no respecter of people. And Jesus didn't look down on Mary, though she was least, last, and lost. We also know that Mary was possessed by seven demons. She was possessed by seven demons. She was not a good lady until she met Jesus. And unlike the woman caught in the act of adultery who was trapped on the outside, Mary was trapped on the inside. And maybe you're here today and you're like, Pastor Chris, I don't have any demons. Like I don't got demons on me. But maybe you have things in your mind, demons that haunt your past. Or maybe your past haunts you. Maybe there's things in your life that just haunt you and keep coming up. And maybe you're here today thinking, I'm okay. I'm not possessed. I'm pretty good. Like, I'm not, I'm not Mary Magdalene in this story. And maybe you don't have literal demons, but maybe you're haunted by your past. Maybe your enemy, can, the enemy continually reminds you of who you were, who you used to be, what you used to do, how you used to act, how you used to be. And maybe he continually reminds you of what you used to do and who you used to be. But I'm thankful that we serve a God that doesn't care so much about your past. He cares about your future. And it's not about, it, it's not about where you've been. It's about where you're going at. And it's about coming to Jesus like just the way you are, but allowing him to transform and change change your life. Listen, the enemy's job is to kill, steal, and destroy your life. It's what he wants to do. But Jesus comes to give life and life abundantly. Mary, she was trapped on the inside and most likely a prostitute. She was a sinner. She was lost. She was hopeless. She was, she was defeated in many ways. But Jesus sets her free and forgives her of her past. Each and every one of us in this room have a past. And if you've been forgiven, you've been, forgi you've been set free. You've been forgiven completely of your past. How many of you in this room, by show of hands, would say, Pastor Chris, I've been coming to church for a long time. Well, you be, you be, uh, my whole life, right? This was Mary. She didn't know Jesus, but the moment she knew Jesus, she spent the rest of her life with him. We don't see what happened to the woman caught in the act of adultery, but we know Mary Magdalene's life was changed so much so that she left her past hometown and she began to follow Jesus. She followed Jesus all the way through it. She probably seen Jesus open blind eyes. She's seen, she, she, she seen demon people get set free. She's seen Jesus perform miracle after miracle. She was there when they fed the multitudes of people. Mary saw everything Jesus did because her life was transformed and she had such dedication and loyalty and devotion to Jesus that she would follow Jesus even to the end. She followed Jesus all the way even to Jerusalem and to Bethany where he was the, just the week before he died. You see, forgiveness doesn't change the past, but it does enlarge our future. Amen, somebody? It does enlarge our future. You see, Mary's past in Magdala, notice that she left where she was and she went somewhere else. Even after Jesus died, Mary never went back to Magdala. Scholars tell us and, and people tell us that she stayed near Jerusalem almost all her life. You see, Mary was there when Jesus got arrested. She was there when they put a crown of thorns on Jesus' head. Mary was there when Jesus got beaten. Mary was there when Jesus got nails driven into his hands and into his, into his feet. She was there through it all. Such loyalty, such devotion. This once broken soul was the first person we see that seen the resurrected Jesus. You know, Mary was the very last person at the foot of the cross. She was there at the cross when it was raining and thundering and the earthquakes happened. She never left Jesus, not once, not until she heard every statement he said. She was there the whole entire time. She was last at the cross, but she was first at the tomb. Scripture tells us that early in the morning on the third day, that Mary walked to the tomb to go put spices on the body of Jesus. She went to put spices on his body and to embalm him because they didn't get to properly do that like they wanted to. And it says that when Mary walked up to the tomb, that she saw that the stone had been rolled away. And she thought someone had stolen her Lord, that someone had stolen her Savior. But as she stayed there and examined it a little bit longer, we see that this person introduces herself or himself to Mary, and she thinks it's this gardener. What have they done with my Lord? What have they done with his body, she says. 
And the moment the gardener says, Mary, the moment the gardener says that Mary's eyes are open and she sees the resurrected Lord, a once broken soul, a once broken person was now charged with telling the disciples uh, that he was alive. Aren't you thankful that he's alive today? That we serve a Jesus that's alive today? You see, Jesus doesn't just forgive us. He expects us to be loyal and righteous through it all, just like Mary Magdalene was, so much so that he charged her with the message of telling this world that he's not dead any longer and that he is risen and risen indeed. You see, if you've been forgiven, if you've been set free, you have a message too. And that message is to tell this dying and broken and hurting world that Jesus is alive and that he can set you free and forgive you free, for forgive you as well. It's the God that we serve. So maybe you're like the woman caught in the act of adultery, just got set free, or maybe you need to be set free. We're gonna give you that, moment, that, that opportunity here in a moment. Or maybe you've been like Mary, you got set free and you followed Jesus for a whole long time. Continue following him and pointing other people to Jesus. Extraordinary Jesus forgives and sets us free. Well, behind me is one of our human videos. It's a drama that these youth have been working on. And this drama depicts and shares the story of the life of Mary Magdalene. We get to see her life all the way at the beginning from when she was probably a prostitute through all of the demon possession, but we see what happens when Mary encounters Jesus. It changes everything. These guys were top three in the state of Ohio. They're gonna be representing us at nationals. Give it up for these guys. Let this human video bless you. Give it up for Jesus, come on. Are you alone out here? Yes. 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 What are you doing so deep in the jungle? She's lost. Oh, she's lost. Hopeless. 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 Don't you know what you are? I know what you are. Mary. I know where you came from. I know your powers. Yes.
I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to help you. I've done so much wrong. None of that matters anymore. But I've got demons in me. Mary, there are no demons here. You're free. There's no place I can go. Your love won't find me. No place I can hide that you don't see. No place I could fall. Your love couldn't catch me. You see it all. You see it all through the eyes of love. This world can be unforgiving. It has a way of condemning us, shaming us, and reminding us of who we are and what we've done. We have to understand that this world does not define us. A person's past, no matter how messed up and ugly it might have been, becomes irrelevant when Jesus steps into the picture. Because when Jesus steps into the room, everything changes. So when we ask ourselves the question, who are you? The answer cannot be found in looking at who you've been or what you've done, but instead in the absolute authoritative truth that Jesus declares over your life. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that can separate us from the love of God that is found in Jesus. No height, no depth, no number of demons or past can separate us from this truth. Good job, guys. Look at that. You know, that human video really touches my heart. Working with this team has been amazing. You know, even just back here watching this, it really hit me. Because just as, you know, Mary was here and Jesus was over here, there's nothing I could do to get myself to Jesus. My righteous, best righteousness on my very best day is like filthy rags. I love what Charles Spurgeon says, great preacher. He said, works, are you saved by works? He says, no, I could easier climb to the moon on a rope of sand than be saved by works. We are saved by the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of God. It wasn't us getting ourselves to God. It was God who came to us and met us in our brokenness and our hurting. And when we were lost, he came to where we were and he picked us up and put us back together and charges us to live a life after him 
forever and ever. I wanna share a scripture with you found in Romans and I can't help but think today that there is some people here in the room today that you need the mercy and the forgiveness of God. You walked into this church today and you had no, you had no idea what was gonna happen. But maybe you've seen Jesus in scripture and you thought, man, that's me. I need that forgiveness. I wanna meet a Jesus and a God who loves and forgives me, but empowers me to live a righteous, truthful life after him. You see, Romans says this, it says, who then is the one who condemns? No one. It says, Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life and is at the right hand of God. He's at the right hand interceding for us. It says that who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine. Is it, or, or is it danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death. The wages of sin is death. Each and every one of us deserve the stones. Each and every one of us deserve to die. The wages of sin is death. I love this. Uh, it says we face that all day long. Sorry. And then it goes on. It says, we were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. That's what we deserve. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. It also goes on to say, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, come on church, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers. It says neither height nor death, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He's the God who saves. You know, I love that picture of the woman caught in the act of adultery. Did you, did you notice the words she said to him when he says, who condemns you? She looks up and she says, no one, Lord. She called him Lord. In that moment, she confessed him as her savior and Lord, the one who saved her life. Maybe today you need saving. Maybe you're like Mary. Maybe you are just haunted by your past and you need to be set free. Or maybe you're like the woman caught in the act of adultery. You need to, to accept the forgiveness of God. And maybe you think, how can I get in right standing with God? How can I ever be and do enough good deeds to be right or righteous? It's not our righteousness that saves us, it's His. But we know when Christ comes on the inside of us, that grace and truth comes on the inside of us as well. And we can become the righteousness of God that's found only in a life with Christ Jesus. Heads bowed and eyes closed here in this place today. If you're here in this room and you would say, Pastor Chris, I need to give my life to Jesus Christ. I'm gonna give you that opportunity here in a moment. I can't help but think there are people here today that need to accept Jesus for the first time. You know, four or five, six hands went up last night. And I can't help but think today there are people that want to give their life to Christ. Maybe it's been a long time. Maybe you haven't been living for him. You came here today and you need to get right with Jesus. You're gonna pray a prayer here in just a second. And I tell our Student Life family this, I say when one prays the prayer, we all pray the prayer because we're a family. This is the family of God. This is the church of God. So if you're here in this room today, no one's looking around except maybe, um, maybe the section leaders. Your section leader may pray with you after you pray this prayer. But if you, if you need to give your life to Christ, on the count of three, I'm just gonna ask that you would raise your hand high so I can see it. I wanna know who I'm praying for today, who I'm praying with today. If that's you today, on the count of three, would you raise your hand? One, this is the best decision you're ever gonna make in your life. Two, three, would you just raise your hand? Say, I need to give my life to Jesus. I see a couple of hands. There's no condemnation here in this place. Yeah, I see some hands in the balcony, yeah. I want you to know you're about to feel the presence and the grace and the love of God. And you're gonna feel his righteousness, that truth come on the inside of you. It's the truth that sets us free. Church family, would you all repeat after me? Remember when one prays the prayer, we all pray and listen, heaven is gonna be rejoicing. And we as a church family are gonna rejoice here in just a second. Repeat after me, say, dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I have fallen short of your glory. I've sinned, will you forgive me? Come into my life and set me free. I stand upon your word and I stand upon your truth that I am free and I am forgiven of my past. 
of my past. And I confess you as my Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Come on, church family. If you prayed that prayer this morning, there's a room to my left, your right, called the VIP room. There are people that would love to resource you. Your section host may even come over to you and pray with you, and that's okay, because we're here. We wanna help you live your best life that you can. Well, church family, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. I believe God's gonna continue, continue to do amazing things as we continue this series. Uh, to my left also is a student life area where some next-gen leaders are gonna be, kids' life leaders are gonna be, student life leaders are gonna be. If you wanna serve in any of these ministries, connect with me, connect with us. Uh, even those human video kids are gonna be out there. Go tell them they did an amazing job. Have a blessed week. We'll see you next Sunday. Thank you, CLC.